Welcome to the top 12 highlights of Chapter 9, Campaigns and Elections. I'm Mr. Rodman taking you through the top 12 highlights of this chapter, uh, looking at elections and the campaigns of the last few years and the impact it has had on the presidency of the United States and the presidency, the Congress, and so forth. Let's start off by talking about how elections actually happen. Uh, they can be either fixed, staggered, or limited. A fixed election is every two years. The House of Representatives sits for a fixed election. Uh, that means every two years, every member of the 435 members of the House of Representatives are up for election. Uh, or re-election if they're running again as an incumbent, uh, but the idea is every House seat is up for grabs. A staggered election is what takes place in the Senate. This is every six years. 33% uh, of the seats are up every two, and over the course of those six years, 33% uh, every two, um, all 100% of the seats will ultimately be, ultimately be up for re-election or election after a uh, three two-year cycles. Uh, so after they go through three of those uh, two-year cycles, 33, 33, 34 essentially, um, is uh, staggered. So you'll only be replacing at any one time 33% if you vote them all out. Uh, only 33% of the Senate would go. And again, that's because it's a cautious and deliberative body. The idea of slowing things down and making sure that um, the decisions that are made there are thought through and very cautious uh, and uh, really not the uh, the whims of the masses as we see in the House, uh, but but much more deliberative thought being given to it in the in the Senate, which is why the staggered elections are taking place. And then we have limited elections. Uh, we have two four-year terms according to the 22nd Amendment. That the president uh, is eligible for either two full four-year terms or a total of 10 years under the Second Amendment, uh, depending on when they start serving. Uh, but the idea there is that uh, no more than two t total four-year terms or a total of 10 years uh, a president is allowed to serve, and then they must uh, step aside, uh, making way for the the, uh, the 25th Amendment, in that case, uh, kicking in in terms of succession. Uh, term limits, uh, we have them only for the president. There are no term limits for senators or House members. Uh, this was uh, uh, some, some states, actually Missouri for one, tried to impose this back in the 90s. It was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and uh, basically said that um, you are violating the Article One of the Constitution and how members are elected for the body. Uh, it's the people uh, that would be the determining factor as to whether or not these people stand for um, uh, another term, and, uh, and they would be deciding that. Now, the president, after serving uh, and winning his second term, uh, would be a lame duck, the idea they could, they could serve two terms, and then uh, they cannot run again. So in this case, they would be a lame duck as, as the cartoon lays out. Uh, or once they announce that they're not running for another term, uh, that also, uh, Lyndon Johnson, for instance, that also would make him a lame duck at that point, uh, meaning that they're still in office, but uh, they'll no longer be running for re-election, so they will be serving out their term and then done. Uh, the Electoral College, we talked a lot about this, and I have a separate video on that, on five things to know about the Electoral College, so please make sure you check that out, uh, post it on Classroom and on YouTube. Uh, the Electoral College magic number is 270. This is one more than half of the total number of electoral votes, 538. Uh, if you divide 538, Excuse me, if you divide 538 uh, by 2, you get 269. One more than 269 is a uh, majority, and that would be 270. Uh, anyone who is going to win the POTUS, Presidency of the United States, would need to win one more than half, and thus the 270 votes that we see there. Uh, what happens if nobody gets a majority uh, of the electoral votes, or it's a tie, 269, 269? In this case, uh, the election for president would go to the House of Representatives. The election for, for vice president would go to the Senate. Uh, each state in the House would have one vote, uh, and the delegation from the House would vote as one vote per state, and uh, then the majority would rule in that particular case. Uh, in the Senate, uh, each senator would have one vote, uh, thus giving each state essentially two votes for vice president. So it is possible that the House could choose a president, the Senate a vice president, President, and they may not even be from the same party if the House and Senate are of different um, majorities uh, made up of different political parties uh, of the majority at the time. Now, uh, 
we haven't seen it come to that. Uh, the last time that was even an issue was 1796 in terms of the um, going to the House of Representatives and some confusion with the 12th Amendment and so forth, and that's all been rectified, or sorry, uh, rectified as part of the 12th Amendment, where uh, a, the, the vice president and president run as a ticket, uh, therefore they're elected as a ticket. Most of what we see is winner take all, the idea of you winning the most votes of that state, you win all the electoral votes for that state, so whether that's 29 electoral votes in Florida, 38 over in Texas, or 55 in California, if you win 50.1% or even a plurality if there's more than two candidates running, but if you win the most votes in that state, you win all of the electoral votes for that state. The only exceptions to this are Maine and Nebraska. The idea here that um, if you win uh, congressional districts, you can win specific electoral votes. For instance, in 2008, President Obama w ran against John McCain, and he won uh, one of the districts in, uh, around, in and around Omaha, Nebraska, while John McCain won the rest of the state. He won the two Senate seats that were one at large for the most votes of the state, and um, and President Obama won one of those districts in and around Omaha. So uh, that is the only exception to the winner-take-all rule. Otherwise, the other 48 states all rule with uh, winner-take-all in mind. You win the most uh, votes in of the state, you win all of the electoral votes for the state. And remember, this is important because it ties back to the idea that states conduct elections, not the national government. So each state determines how its electoral votes are allocated, and Maine and Nebraska have decided that they are allocated according to congressional district, and then for the Senate electoral votes um, according to uh, the the popular vote overall in those states. So is it possible to win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College? Yes, we saw living proof of this in 2000, uh, where Bush won the Electoral College uh, by winning Florida and thus um, went clinching the Electoral College vote, 271, uh, out of 270 that were needed, uh, to Al Gore uh, winning the popular vote by about 500,000, but losing the Electoral College by a mere a mere four votes, four electoral votes. I always say had he won Florida or had he won his home state of Tennessee, he would have been the president of the United States. We wouldn't have even had to look to Florida if he had won Tennessee. Uh, so lesson learned there. But it's not just Al Gore we need to ask. We could also ask Hillary Clinton in this last election uh, because of California. Uh, the number of voters in California, it did put her over the popular vote. Um, by uh, a million and a half votes, and uh, she won the popular vote while Donald Trump won the Electoral College. So it is possible that that has happened. We've seen this five times, and again, if you want more details on that particular piece, check out my uh, Electoral College uh, video that's that's done separately on the uh, electoral college process and and five things you need to know about that. General election day, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's when we go to vote. We vote for the general election. They vote for. Uh, candidates for Dem Democratic Party uh, th that are running and candidates for the Republican Party that are running against each other uh, to determine who is going to be the victor, who will be the representative uh, in the House, in the Senate, uh, gubernatorial races or state races, as well as the presidency. State Election Day is the Electoral College Day. This comes the Monday after the second Wednesday in December. This is where states actually go to their state capitals. They cast their votes for electors for president in the uh, state election day and uh, they'll sign the certificates of the uh, electors uh, that will then be sent on to the Senate uh, that will be opened uh, after the, the new Senate is seated on January 3rd. Uh, the real election day is actually January 6th. This is when the Senate will uh, unseal the electoral votes. They will count them. Uh, they will read them. They will determine based on the count who is the Electoral College winner, the official Electoral College winner. Yes, we usually know that on election night, uh, but it isn't until January 6th when the real election day actually takes place, when the Senate certifies the votes of the Electoral College. Uh, so that is uh, essentially the real election day uh, when the president is chosen. And then inauguration day is January 20th at high noon, according to Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution. That is when the new president, uh, as determined by the Electoral College, will take their oath of office. Now, some advantages with the Electoral College, it's obviously quick, uh, and it does support a federal system. It gives the states a very important role that isn't just based on population, but based on their electoral votes. Even 
though the electoral votes are based on House members, which is based on population, and then every uh, every state getting two uh, electoral votes from the senators that they have. Uh, so it is quick. Um, most of the time by the 11 o'clock news, we can find out who the winner is. Um, and the intention here was that it would not be a whim of the masses. It would not be a popularity contest, but it would be uh, done by informed voters, people who uh, were literate, who weren't out in the fields all day. Uh, they were making informed decisions, and based on those decisions, they were able um, to make an informed vote, uh, an educated vote uh, based on that, and that uh, it would be in the best interests of the people of the country. Now, some of the disadvantages. Um, it's a very complex system. Electoral college is not easy for people to understand, even people taking government class. Winner-take-all tends to distort uh, many of the states. Um, yeah, it's easy to declare who wins and who loses, uh, but the, the races in some of these cases uh, in the 2016 election, when you saw Michigan and Wisconsin, they were very close races. A couple thousand votes or less determined uh, who won all of the electoral votes in that state. Even though it was very, very close, um, Donald Trump won all of the electoral votes for the state. Hillary Clinton got nothing as a result of that. So it does tend to distort this winner-take-all approach, does tend to distort the will of the people in terms of making it look very lopsided, even when uh, the vote may be much closer than we uh, the, the Electoral College gives it credit for. Also keep in mind that, as we talked about, the person with the most votes uh, may win the popular vote but lose the Electoral College. And um, keep in mind that the Constitution doesn't say the electors have to vote uh, for whom the state pledges. Uh, state law in some states does require this, and we talked about the idea that there are some rogue voters, but for the most part, uh, the Constitution says that they just need to go vote. They don't necessarily need to vote for who they wish. And there was some uh, some uh, controversy around whether or not the electors in this last uh, presidential election would actually vote for Donald Trump. Uh, they ended up doing so, but there was some controversy as to whether or not people would go rogue and vote for someone else, like John Kasich or uh, someone uh, some someone else. And uh, so that uh, did kind of throw some... Uh, some controversy into the works as to whether it would really happen or not. Uh, but in the end, the, he did. Uh, president Trump did win the Electoral College vote, and as a result, the presidency. Um, the last piece is uh, that the House of Representatives has a lot more sway in this uh, to determine who uh, would ultimately become the um, the uh, the president. And if it's thrown into that election, uh, as we saw here, uh, we have seen that um, from time to time. The issue of, um, now I mentioned in 1796 was the issue of people didn't know whether they were voting for president or vice president. Uh, and that was the last time, and 12th Amendment pretty much cleared that up. But we have seen a couple of races that were thrown into the House of Representatives, as I mentioned. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson in 1800 is an example of this. John Quincy Adams making a deal with Speaker of the House Henry Clay uh, in 1824, which would cost Clay any chance at a nomination for the presidency uh, later on, uh, the, the thing he really wanted most in life. And would, get, would lead to a lot of controversy after 1824 election that would uh, propel Andrew, John, uh, Andrew Jackson, excuse me, uh, to run in 1828 and, and pounce uh, on, um, on John Quincy Adams in the Electoral College and ultimately win the presidency. So uh, it is not without controversy uh, nonetheless. People have tried to get rid of the Electoral College, but the idea is that it is still with us and, and is here to stay uh, for now. And, and as much as people grumble, and they did this after the 2000 election, uh, we saw, as we see, 16, 17 years later, uh, that people continue uh, to use the Electoral College, and, and the groundswell of support just has not been there to, uh, to get rid of it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, check out the five things you need to know about the Electoral College, a separate video. It's shorter than this one, so you're welcome. Uh, but it is also... Um, uh, chock with a uh, chock full of, of some things that uh, you really need to know about the Electoral College and it goes in a little more detail there so hopefully you'll find that helpful remember how do we determine the Electoral College votes every House of Representatives seat is going to get a vote uh, so as I as I mentioned in Florida with 29 electoral votes they have 27 House members two senators every state gets two electoral votes for their Senate seats and the number of House seats so in Maryland for instance we have eight House uh, 
members and we have two senators so we have 10 electoral votes california 53 house members and two senators so 55 electoral votes and you can look at the map and and do the math uh it's also fun to check out this uh this map where you can actually uh do make your own predictions about the 2016 election or even 2020 uh it's called 270towin.com so go to 270towin.com and check it out uh and you can make your own predictions about that election but let's move on with number seven elections uh many times are safe seats. Um, most of the House of Representatives seats are not contests. Uh, many of them are safe seats, meaning that the challenger has a very, very small chance of winning. Uh, the reason for this is incumbency advantage. The idea that the incumbent, the person who is currently holding the office, uh, has a lot of perks to be able to um, to uh, throw out there to the, the people, the constituents of that district. And that record of incumbency really uh, plays to their advantage because they can talk about the things they've done, about the things they're doing, and about the things they're going to do. And it really underscores uh, the credibility that they have in being in the office and in what they're doing in the office. Now, don't be fooled. Gerrymandering has a lot to do with it today. And we've seen a lot of districts, including ones in Maryland, that are heavily gerrymandered in, in order to favor one party or the other. Democrats are guilty of this. Republicans are guilty of this. Uh, and they do this in many, many states um, in terms of trying to favor uh, their party over the other party. And we've seen this done uh, in, in many states, Maryland included, uh, New York State, Texas, Wisconsin, California, a number of states in which uh, the party in power in the in the state legislature basically is tasked with drawing the lines, and they will determine uh, what those lines look like uh, for the next 10 years. So gerrymandering alive and well, and definitely having an impact on these safe seats. Uh, the coattails also do play a role, though not as um, not as stark a role as we used to see. We did see a couple of uh, Senate races that definitely hinged on Donald. Trump getting out the vote in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where uh, Pat Toomey and um, Ron Johnson uh, won their Senate races, and it was uh, propelled by uh, the vote that Donald Trump brought out to the polls uh, to vote for him on Election Day. Uh, it definitely helped in, in some of those st states and in some of those Senate races. Uh, so the coattail effects definitely have an impact, um, though uh, we saw a lot more of that 20, 25 years ago than we than we see in most races today. Uh, an important point to, to make about the midterm elections is that the president usually loses seats, the president's party, uh, that is, uh, in midterm elections. We'll have a midterm coming up in 2018. Uh, so in that race, uh, it is expected that Republicans will lose seats. But again, to be continued, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but this is uh, not out of the ordinary, usually because the party that's in power and controlling the White House uh, gets blamed in the midterm uh, for whatever's going wrong. Uh, gets credit for uh, things they may do, but for the most part is really held accountable uh, for the things uh, that they're doing and, and more importantly, the things they're not doing or the scandal or controversy. All of those things tend to add up over the first two years of a presidency and people take it out on them in the midterms. And that's not to say that it always happens, but uh, but more often than not, the president's party does lose seats as a result of that. Uh, which leads us to number nine. Let's talk about Iowa and New Hampshire. As we lead into uh, the 2020 race for president, uh, and uh, the idea of Iowa, the first caucus, and New Hampshire, the first primary, uh, we see what's called front-loading. Uh, this is a concept that isn't given a lot of, uh, of time in your book by Dr. Magleby, uh, but it is an important one, and it is on your, um, on your concept cards and in your reading guide, and um, it's the important piece here basically trying to move up your primary or caucus to as close to the Iowa and New Hampshire races as possible in order to get uh, credibility for your state. South Carolina and Nevada have done this. Uh, D.C. did this for a while. A number of states uh, tried to move it up before New Hampshire and Iowa in order to gain that credibility, and, and political party uh, committees really push back on that and uh, 
tried to incentivize uh, states to move theirs back so that Iowa could be the first caucus and New Hampshire the first primary. Uh, but why do they do this? They do this for media exposure. They want to get a lot more coverage. And they know that at the beginning, um, it, people, it really matters because we don't have a front runner yet. We don't have a, somebody who's in the lead, and that's going to get a lot more press coverage. Um, if you're the you know 20th primary taking place and the front runner has already been established, then who cares at that point? Uh, we're not going to see lots of changes happening happening there. Uh, and so uh, that's why states want to be first, or at least they want to be third or fourth. Uh, and that's why they tend to front load or move up their primaries or caucuses to earlier on in the process. Uh, let's talk money. Let's talk campaign finance here. Uh, FECA, the idea of the Federal Election Campaign Act, was actually uh, passed in 1974, but really started uh, the evolution of this started in 1971, looking at the process uh, and, and trying to create a Federal Election Commission, uh, which didn't have a whole lot of teeth until 1974 with the Federal Election Campaign Act. Um, it basically provided partial funding in order to provide tax dollars to presidential candidates, which is pretty much dead at this point because um, many of them see private funding as much more profitable uh, than trying to accept um, presidential uh, par public funding dollars. Uh, John McCain was the last one to accept that, and since then we've seen no one accept that uh, since then because they can raise so much more money outside of uh, outside of that race. Uh, John McCain could raise, what, $67 million uh, through public funding, a combination of public funding and private funding, and President Obama, you know, at that point could dwarf him with $250 million. Uh, there was no contest. In this last race, um, you know, the, the amounts raised were uh, upwards of a billion dollars by both parties and candidates. So that's pretty much a, a dead issue. Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976, basically said if you're a millionaire and you want to spend money on your own campaign, you can. It doesn't mean you can spend it on other campaigns, but you can spend it on your own. Uh, and uh, in, in that particular case, uh, the unlimited amounts of money you spend, as long as it's on your own campaign or your spouse's, uh, you can spend that money however you wish. And um, that is part of your freedom of speech. Uh, now, the uh, PACs were created as a result of FICA, uh, these political action committees. And it basically basically said, hey, you can donate up to today, we'll look at it as $5,000, to a political action committee for a particular candidate. Um, there is an affiliation with the candidate, which is unlike any of the other types of, um, of committees that we see today. Um, it's the only one that can can confer or coordinate with the candidate, uh, but you are limited in terms of how much money you can accept from a particular donor. Uh, and as I said, it's five thousand dollars per campaign, uh, meaning five thousand for the the primary and five thousand for the general election. Now, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of two thousand two basically outlawed soft money, this idea of collecting uh, dark money for political party building purposes by the political parties, it was used as a slush fund to help candidates, even though it wasn't designed to originally. Um, and BCR, BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, or McCain-Feingold, uh, essentially banned that soft money. It also banned those contributions uh, by corporations and, and unions uh, to also say that, that they couldn't spend unlimited amounts of money. That would be later overturned, that particular piece would be overturned uh, by the Citizens United case, uh, Citizens United VFEC, that was uh, ruled on in 2010. They, up, they upheld, excuse me, however, they upheld the uh, soft money ban that we see here in BCRA for individuals. Okay, so we talked about PACs, political action committees, as kind of the fundraising arm of these interest groups. They can raise $5,000 per election, and they can be affiliated with a campaign. Now, the other things I'm going to talk about here, the other types of groups, cannot have any affiliation with a candidate. However, uh, what they can accept in terms of donations is unlimited. Some of it has to be reported, some of it not, uh, but there is no coordination with the candidate or campaign in any of these other three types of organizations. The first one is a 527. This basically came out of the BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, in which soft money was banned. We know that money, like water, takes the path of least resistance, and it went right to uh, these issue ad groups, which basically could collect money in unlimited amounts. Uh, they ultimately had to report the money, but um, but not necessarily uh, before the election, so after the election, who cares? Um, and they could also keep pretty private. Uh, any, of, any type of coordination uh, with the campaign uh, was not allowed, 
but what they wanted to do, how they raised their money, how they spent the money, was all uh, off the table. Uh, nobody knew how that was money was being raised, in what amounts, who was donating, um, <clears throat> and all of that uh, was was very dark in terms of that perspective. So soft money was alive and well. With the citizens, with the citizens united, uh, the idea there is uh, that super PACs were born, as were 501c4s, and super PACs basically are the um, the 527s on steroids, because basically you can raise all unlimited amounts of money. It doesn't have to be for a particular candidate. Uh, it can be. Uh, it doesn't have to be an issue ad anymore. Uh, so you can support a candidate or oppose a candidate, uh, or you can suppose a slew of candidates, and you can raise unlimited amounts of money. There's no affiliation or coordination with the campaign or the candidate, uh, but you also don't have to report this uh, until the, uh, the election's over. And uh, with the FEC, um, and you do have to file reports, but most of that can be done after the election. Even if you have to pay a fine, big deal. Uh, I'll wait till after the election because nobody's going to care after the election. And uh, that's how super PACs basically uh, end up raising hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to be spent by these outside groups uh, in in campaigns against candidates as well as for them. And all of the money uh, tends to be dark money. Now the last group is 501c4s. These are not for profit organizations. Uh, a majority of their uh, primary purpose must be non-political. Uh, it must be non-political. So they can spend 49.1% of their money and time uh, on political purposes, but uh, the majority of their fund cannot be political. Now, uh, the, the upside to this, this non-political organization is that they can accept money in unlimited amounts by uh, dark money, by anonymous donors, and they don't have to dispose, uh, disclose any of this to the FEC at all, ever. Uh, they only have to report to the IRS uh, their list of donors. And even that doesn't have to be publicly acknowledged. So this is very dark money. And this is where we're seeing a lot of money go today to these out, these two outside groups, Super PACs and 501c4s, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars in these races um, by these outside groups. They don't have any affiliation with the campaign or the candidate, but many of these organizations are run by former staffers of candidates that are running. A great example of this is the Super PACs, uh, Ready for Hillary and um, uh, the uh, the Jeb Bush PAC. Uh, before they announced their candidacy, they could actually fundraise for these Super PACs because they were not yet candidates. Uh, so what did they do? They raised money for Super PACs to the tune of $100, $100 million uh, Jeb Bush 117 and I think Hillary was about 125 million and um, and as a result of this they didn't have to um, separate themselves from the candidacy or the candidate or the campaign until they announced officially that they were running for president and then there was no coordination but the people that were staffing these organizations were former Hillary and Jeb Bush staffers so you they knew the policy agenda they knew the priorities they knew the ideological stances um, they essentially were insiders surrogates of the candidate themselves so while there was no coordination we know that there really is a lot of coordination going on behind the scenes in terms of those contribution limits I talked about, remember the magic number here is $2,700 per election. PACs uh, can collect $5,000 from an individual, again, per election. Party committees, $10,000. Party national uh, party committees, uh, $33,000. And uh, national party committee accounts and other things, about $100,000. And per McCutcheon uh, VFEC, which I'll talk about in a second, there is no cap anymore. So this is really important. And the two numbers you really probably need to know the most uh, is that $2,700 number and that $5,000 number. Because people can donate to PACs uh, per election at $5,000 cap and to individual candidates at the $2,700 cap. And that's probably the most important ones uh, that you really need to know there. In terms of who's giving what, who's getting it, and where is it going, uh, I kind of talked about these just now, but here's the corporations and unions we were talking about. According to uh, the Citizens United case, uh, case, they are people too. Uh, so their money can go to the 501c4s I mentioned here. It can go to 527s or super PACs. Uh, not so much to the federal PACs because remember, this is going in unlimited amounts of cash. Huge. Uh, and many of it going directly into ads uh, that are going on television for or against 
candidates. Uh, so this is very different and really muting the individual donations that we see in much smaller amounts, except where individuals are donating to super PACs or 501c4s. Uh, and that's where they can do this, again, in unlimited amounts, most of it um, uh, unreported amounts, and they have a much bigger sway in terms of the impact they can have there. Uh, if you want to see more details, uh, the Wall Street Journal had a really good piece on campaign finance, where your money can go. This is kind of a simulation. If you Google it, uh, it'll come up, and it's a really neat uh, way to see who's receiving what and who's giving what and where does the money go. Kind of follow the money and the money trail and see uh, what impact these groups are having today. The last thing I want to leave you with is uh, some of these landmark cases. I mentioned both of these a minute ago. Citizens United was a landmark case because it basically said corporations and unions are people too. They have free speech spending rights in terms of spending money in unlimited amounts and they can do so on the air, in ads, in creating super PACs or creating 527s. Uh, and uh, and the BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, cannot limit them in uh, their free speech rights uh, under this. This opened the floodgates to unions and corporations uh, and lots of outside groups in, in taking millions of dollars and putting it into campaigns for and against different candidates. Uh, with the McCutcheon ruling, uh, basically there was a cap on the amount of money that an individual could donate to various candidates throughout the election. It was a cap of about $100,000 and change. And they said basically, you know, no more than 50 candidates can you donate to or some uh, weird uh, mathematical figure for this. And uh, the Supreme Court said, no, that's unconstitutional. It violates my individual free rights. If I want to donate $2,700 per candidate per election to every person who's in, who's in Congress and their opponents, and if I want to uh, write the check for those and, and do that, I have the right to do so. And so McCutcheon uh, was really a, an individual free speech case. But again, it opened a lot more individual contribution cash uh, to candidates uh, that were collecting those $2,700 smaller donor donations. That's all for Chapter 9. Hope you found campaigns and elections to be helpful. Good luck on the quiz, test, and upcoming exam. Live the five.